Hello, friends, and welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. My name is Scott Cowan, and I'm the host of the show. Each episode, I have a conversation with an interesting guest who is living in or from Washington State. These are casual conversations with real and interesting people. I think you're going to like the show. So let's jump right in with today's guest. All right. I am sitting down today with Chris Baldwin, who is probably my favorite person in the world right now because Chris sent me coffee. And uh, Chris is the owner of Island Time Coffee in Whidbey, Whidbey Island. So, Chris, welcome. I'm sipping. I'm Thank sipping you. on some of your Deception Blend right now. Um, what Deception Dark? Deception Dark. I'm trying to decide if I want to say it's my favorite of the of your coffees. It's it's a tough battle for me. Yeah, there's two. I, I really like the. Uh, I really like your your French roast too. And, uh, but we're gonna we're gonna. Oh, okay. So, Excellent. Chris, what I know about you is that you are a designer and an artist, and you've been doing that for a long time. And you own Island Time Coffee Company, which my biggest question that I think is important for me is I love coffee, and I don't own a coffee company. So what was the motivation for you to – launch this thing that's my first question yeah well that's that's a that's a long question um the motivation for starting the coffee company uh its genesis goes way back i think if because it's really it's more to me than just a coffee company okay. it's it's a brand and i've always been you know kind of consumed with branding and commercial art and graphic design and kind of a love of coffee. Um, I guess if you simplify it this way and we can kind of get into sort of the, the genesis of it, but if you, if you visualized a, a Venn diagram, right. With three circles. Right. And the first circle, the first circle would be just sort of like my interest and love of coffee. The second circle would be, you know, my, my background in design and marketing and my interest in all things packaging. And then the third circle would be island life and the island lifestyle and living here on the island. And, you know, where those three circles meet in the middle, that's Island Time Coffee. All right. Thank you for the great introduction and the reason. But let's now we're going to go back a few years. So what I'm aware of is you went to Western. Yep. Graduated Western in 1986. Okay. Uh, moved to Seattle right after that. And started my career as a commercial artist, illustrator, and graphic designer. I loved living in Seattle in '86. I I had just gotten where'd out you of, live? Uh, well, I actually in '86 I lived in Redmond, but um, I had just gotten out of college at Central in '86, and so uh, okay. uh, Seattle in the late mid mid and late '80s was a great place to live. So I, I lived in Redmond. A lot of my friends were musicians, so. Uh, we would spend our, you know, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays at, at various uh, establishments in the Puget Sound region, not just Seattle, Seattle, Bellevue, Everett, Tacoma, all of that. And you could get around. Traffic wasn't you – could, you could go from Redmond to Tacoma in an evening and not worry about it being stuck on 405. I mean, it was easy. So where did you start your career? You know what the secret sauce – the secret sauce back then was that you could actually rent – a cheap apartment. You could get a few guys together and actually rent a crappy house in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And you can get, you can get started that way. I mean, that's how all those musicians got started. That's how, you know, artists got started. You know, I mean, it's such a shame that, you know, that's kind of vanished from the ecosystem. You know, yeah. you just can't get that foothold in the door, but anyways, I'm digressing. No, no, you're, um, you're okay. Because I will share this with you with you. So later on in 86 near probably October, November, I found a one bedroom beach cottage over in West Seattle by um, Lincoln park, right on the water. And I got that for $600 a month. And everyone thought I was absolutely insane for paying that much rent. And I was, but, Man, that was a cool place. I had a duck to go through all the doorways because it was like a three quarter size house. It wasn't, it was a beach cabin. It wasn't designed for full time living. You know, it was designed for somebody to go and spend their summer afternoons there. And that was, 
I, that was a great place. So I don't know what that place would, well, it's not, it doesn't even exist anymore. They put a three story house there. Um, what was oh, your, I'm let, me, sure. I'm what, sure. let me ask you this question. Your first place that you remember in Seattle, what was, what was your rent? what did you have to pay for? What was your share of rent? Oh, I think it was a hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. You know, I was in a house up in Del Ridge mm -hmm. for a while. And, uh, and after a few years of kind of doing the roommate thing, I kind of finally decided to get my own apartment. And so that was in, uh, off Stoneway, uh, oh, near yeah. the Woodland Park Zoo. Yeah. Yeah. Great area town. Um, still, still great I lived area. in Wallingford and a couple of different places. Yeah. Okay. And, and, where and was you're your... right. You know, the beauty of it. Oh, go ahead. No, no, you're fine. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, you know, and the beauty of it in that location too, is that, uh, you know, I-5 was still sticky even back in the day back then, but, uh, you know, you could hop on I-90 and be anywhere in the greater Seattle area in just like 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I-90, I, I meant 99. 99. Yeah. But I... you know, I could roll it and, you know, we'd go downtown every weekend to see, you know, uh, bands and do the whole, uh, thing down there at Pioneer, Pioneer Square. And, uh, so I got to ask you in, in 86, who were you going up? What bands were you seeing in 86? And this is welcome to the show that starts off about coffee. And now we're going to talk about 80 Seattle music, but what, the <laughs> hell? um, what, what, who were you going to see in the, in the mid to late eighties? Uh, mostly probably towards the late eighties. I had a bunch of friends that got into the grunge scene. Uh, we'd go see this band called hell America. Uh, Red Platinum, uh, gosh, um, boy, Runaway Trains, they're a little bit more of a, you know, a punk band. Uh, and I remember, you know, even seeing like uh, Alice in Chains a few times before they hit, you know, and Soundgarden was playing at the, uh, uh, the off ramp. They'd right. sometimes play the underneath a pseudo name. So I saw them a bunch of times. Yeah. My, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Allison Chains played for a birthday party for him and, uh, you know, in a, pri yeah. a private, a private party, you know, I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. See, that was the first time I saw Allison Chains at the central tavern. Oh, geez. Okay. And I had no idea who they were. Mm -hmm. And my friend's band opened up for him and we decided to stick around and, and hear him, you know, Oh, let's see what this other band's like, you know? And you know, it was loud and noisy and I didn't know the music, you know, and I know that they were, you know, they were banging it out and I appreciate it, but you know, I didn't think anything of it. <laughs> Neither did I. Neither did I. I just, that one, they, they yeah, I, I saw, yeah, no, they just, it, look, no disrespect, but it just, it wasn't my, they didn't click for me either. Cause like you said, they were loud and I didn't know the songs and yeah, I just, yeah. Anyway. Oh, the good old and days. And then you have Seattle. to ask yourself, where were you the first time you heard Teen Spirit? I know exactly where I was, actually. I was, oh, in, a wow. where, I was in a warehouse in Kent putting cookies and crackers into the back of a truck. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I, was, I was actually, I was in Bellevue uh, going to my parents' house, and I just parked the car and had the radio on. And I got out of the car to check the mailbox, right, for my parents. And suddenly this riff comes on the radio, and I go, oh, what's that? <laughs> and I go in the car and, and and heard it for the very first time. And I remember just being, just blew my socks off. Yeah, I was uh, I was loading trucks uh, for Nabisco. I was, uh, uh, after after a, a failed professional launch as a college student, I, uh, I took a blue-collar job to pay the bills. And, um, that was supposed to last just a brief period of time and seven and a half years later. Um, but anyway, in the warehouse, uh, whoever was standing in the back of the truck, stacking the, the cases of cookies and crackers in the truck would get to control who was blasting music throughout the warehouse. And this kid who was a couple years younger than me, uh, put this thing on and I'm like, what is this? Wait a second. You know, and that was, that was the first time I heard it. And I, I was like all of us, I think, amazed at what it was and how it took over the airwaves for quite a while. So, yeah, yeah, that was a fun time.
Yeah. It was a fun time being in Seattle, you know, at ground center of the, the grunge revolution and just all the attention Seattle got. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it was fun. But then you left and you moved to Whidbey. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and I moved away too. But so you started your professional career there. And then how long have you, and well, let's go to Whidbey. How long have you been living on Whidbey? Well, uh, let me get to that in a second. Um, so I was living in Seattle at the time. And uh, that's where I met my wife. And uh, and then we got married and decided that, uh, you know, we wanted to buy our first starter home. So that's what <laughs> got me out to Whidbey Island. Um, even, even, you know, even though we started this interview, you talk about how pricing was a lot more affordable, housing was a lot more affordable. You know, I still had to move out quite a ways to get my first starter home. Right. Um, and, you know, I, we were living in Shoreline at the time, you know, in the mid nineties. And, you know, I, I loved living downtown. I love living in Wallingford. I love living in West Seattle. But that more suburban environment of like shoreline just didn't work for me. And at the time, you know, I was doing all my work, you know, through, you know, faxes and FedExes and things like that. And I was almost working remotely anyways, because a lot of my clients were national clients at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I could go work remotely somewhere. So, you know, either, either I'm going to live in the city or I'm not, I'm going to get out. So we chose to move someplace a lot more rural. Um, to yeah, start our lives over and, and raise a family and do the island lifestyle. So that was in 1995. So almost 30 um, years. But going back to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, my kids were born and raised here. Uh, I, am, am I a local? No. Because, <laughs> you know, if you compare yourself to, you know, the old school families that live out here, uh, yeah, it, it takes a while to be considered a true local. Right. Did you, when you, when you moved out there in, in 95, did you miss, I mean, you, you, now you're on an Island. Yeah. You can drive around the North way and you know, you don't have to take a ferry, but let's be realistic. It's, you're going to take a ferry to get off the Island. What sort of, if any, did you guys have any, you know, acclimation challenges to, to Island lifestyle or did you just settle right into the, less hectic pace? Um, there was definitely an acclimation period. But I think that when you have small kids, mm-hmm. that you're sort of immediately part of the club um, because you've, you know, you're doing school stuff, uh, your kids make friends and you meet other parents and then there's soccer games and, you know, um, you know, it, it's nice to be in a community that's really based on, you know, following the schools and, and all of that. So it, it, I, it takes a while to make, you know, a new set of friends that way, but you know, you're busy. I, I'm busy with my home, my own business. I'm busy with, you know, with familyhood, um, doing all that kind of stuff. So, you know, plus we still had all of our connections in Seattle. We still had all of our friends and so forth. So, um, yeah, I, I, I loved it. Okay. I love getting to know new people, the new environment, the new community. And back then, you know, South would be in particular, you know, was a, was a thriving real community. It had a middle class, it had jobs, uh, it had a growing school system. Um, so it was a, it was a really special place to be. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful there. I remember as a little kid, my great aunt, her and her husband and their, they had a family cabin somewhere on the water there. Don't ask me where. And the only thing I really remember is we went there for a visit. And I might've been eight, 10 at the most. And my cousins were going outside and I was younger, a little younger than them. And you know, when you're eight or 10 and somebody's like, 12 and 14 there's a that's a big gap right like yeah and they they closed the right. they closed the sliding door glass slider door and i didn't see that and i ran right into that thing at full speed and, uh, that's that's my that's my biggest memory of Whidbey island is running into that sl- uh, slider door i don't know that that's the best memory to have um yeah i still when i think about it it still hurts you know anyway. it's, it's it's funny you mention that 
it's funny you mention that because I know that, uh, you know, whenever I'm off Island or visiting people in Seattle or friends or whatnot, and you meet, you know, you're always meeting new people and it, it inevitably it comes up in conversation, you know, Oh, where do you live? You know, da, 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 da. And then I'll tell somebody, you know, I live in, uh, on Woodby Island. I live in Langley and I almost always get this universally same response. And that is that, you know, they go, Oh, yeah, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. My cousin got married out there or, you know, uh, my dad used to go fishing out there or I have a friend that's got a cabin or this, this and that out there. And I always get this really, you know, positive, you know, reaction from them. And, and I know that part of the brand that I wanted to build was that, you know, embracing, you know, the Island lifestyle is part of that because of that, that six degrees of Kevin Bacon separation that I just discussed, uh, you know, pe people, you know, have that, they understand the brand, they understand what the islands are like, and they have that, you know, try to build that sort of emotional connection with the brand. So when did you launch the brand? What year did you officially hang out the shingle? Um, it was, I actually started in 2021. Okay. Uh, right at the height of the pandemic. <laughs> what um, you major in college? I'll give you a little bit before I. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I majored in uh, graphic design. I'm teasing, but you're opening a business during the pandemic. Okay. Yeah. All right. What's the backstory? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, again, I was thinking about this this morning. I was thinking about my first sort of experiences with coffee. And I know that I, I had a roommate in college that was really into coffee culture. And I, and I barely even had my first cup of coffee back in that day. So I, I learned a lot from him. And, uh, and I remember after graduating and getting my first bachelor place, literally one of the first things I bought was a coffee grinder. Wow. Cause I knew that grinder. I had to grind. I know. I was like, what is this thing for? I had to, right. you know, grind my own beans and make fresh coffee every morning. I just, that's what I was taught how to drink coffee. And, you know, and back in the day, you know, the, the coffee revolution in Seattle was just getting going and you could actually start to get, you know, uh, whole bean coffee, local roasted whole bean coffee on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And I remember trying, you know, Starbucks and, uh, and Tully's coffee and Seattle's best coffee, you know, so I started drinking those brands mm -hmm. and, you know, I was digging in and, uh, uh, but I didn't think too much of it. Um, it was just something that I kind of enjoyed and, but, you know, as my career in commercial art and graphic design grew and so forth, I started to become more and more aware of brands and marketing. And, uh, you know, I mean, I could walk into a grocery store and just geek out on almost every single aisle, you know, on the different packaging, you know, the different design trends and all this kind of stuff. And of course, you know, uh, buying coffee, you know, I'm always following, you know, the design trends for coffee. And I, I remember, I remember in the late eighties when Starbucks first came out with one of their, uh, first packaging pushes and they had this, uh, they had this generic bag. They had one bag for all their different varieties, but then to designate the variety, they had these stickers that they would put on the bag. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the French roast would be, they would have this sticker on it, you know, that, that, you know, had the Eiffel tower and said French roast, you know, and they had a sticker for Italian roast and they had a sticker for Ethiopian, you know, and all these kinds of things. And the stickers were kind of modeled after, oh gosh, you know, traveling in the early 20th century, you know, with your steamer mm -hmm. trunk yep. and you could cover them with travel stickers from around the world. Right. Yes. That was sort of, you know, what these, these stickers look like. And I, I just remember just thinking that was so cool. <laughs> what a great packaging idea. And I love the designs and so forth. Um, so that you, you kind of get an idea how my, my mind kind of works when I'm looking at this stuff. And, and as I was working as a commercial illustrator, um, I even got called into uh, Hornell Anderson, which is a design firm in Seattle at the time. And one of their accounts was Starbucks. And they called me in. They were going to be doing a, uh, the next generation of packaging after the packaging I just discussed. 
And it's not uncommon that they'll call in commercial artists to kind of come in and do some storyboards or do some comps and things like that, just to kind of uh, see what my take would be on their sort of marketing direction. And, and I did some ideas and so forth and they didn't really fly and they, you know, they, they just paid me for my time. Mm -hmm. Um, But I got a glimpse at, you know, kind of where that was going and so forth. And uh, I was a little disappointed. They didn't pick my designs and directions, but, uh, that's okay. That's kind of the way it goes sometimes. Um, but anyways, uh, so then a few years after that, then I moved to Whidbey Island and I'm still deep in the industry. Um, I still have an agent. I'm still doing uh, projects from all around the country. Um, but when I go into my local coffee shop, I mean, my local grocery store, you know, now I'm starting to notice, you know, the local brands. So mm-hmm. You know, now I got to start drinking, you know, the local roasters. Um, so, you know, I kind of got to know them. I got to know their product and so forth. And I personally got to know a couple of roasters. Um, but I tell you, when I, when I was looking at how they handled their marketing and their design and their brands, I saw a hole. I, I saw a gap in, I think, how they should have been marketing. Um so I, I, I just kept coming back to that again and again and again, thinking, God, you know, if I ever started a coffee company, <laughs> uh, you know, I know what I would do, right? right? I would, I would do it differently because I would be an authentic local roaster, right? I would roast locally. I would have that quintessential Northwest coffee flavor profile, and I would embrace a sense of place. I would embrace, I would embrace all things island life. Um, and that, that thought was in my head for years. And then, you know, and then the pandemic came along. And suddenly I had extra time on my hand. And <laughs> that thought kind of percolated to the top of my mind. I thought, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put together a business plan. So I designed up all the packaging, designed up all the labels. Uh, I ran all the numbers the best I could, and I put together a business plan. Of course, you know, I promised my wife, Darlene, I would put together a real business plan if we were going to actually try to pull off a real business. Uh, so we massaged it and went over it together and so forth, and, and then decided to pull the trigger, you know, right there in the middle of this uh, massive slowdown. All right. So I got to ask you this question. I got to ask you this question. Now, this is the toughest business question I'm going to ask you. And it, 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 I don't mean it to be tough, but you said you designed, you ran some numbers, right? Projections of what you thought it would be. Were you close? Were you close or did you miss the mark? (laughs) I, I think it was solid. Okay. But literally three months into the endeavor of getting on the shelf, all of a sudden there's these massive uh, shortages and supply chain issues <laughs> and inflation was kicking in and suddenly the cost of bags went up 50%. The cost of coffee went up 30%. Uh, all these things just blew a hole in my business plan right off the bat. Right. I, and so <laughs> what I've, what I've experienced is that, um, a business, the first business plan, especially is, you know, uh, it's good. It's a good exercise, but it's, it's an exercise. Exactly. It's not nothing, nothing to really, I mean, you got, what is it? Mike Tyson famously said, you know, something like, yeah, you, you got a plan to fight somebody until they punch you in the face, something, to, something to that effect. And, and basically, yeah. I mean, you, how do you predict? Yeah supply chain how do you predict inflation or uh you know in coffee a, a bad coffee crop year um a, you know a devastating coffee crop year let's say you know yeah so one of the things you know so, what go ahead no you go ahead oh i was just gonna say that um that yeah it uh it completely turned everything kind of upside down as far as my initial plan and so forth. But, you know, that just made me back off a little bit. It made me realize that, you know, let's just ride this thing part time. Mm -hmm. Let's just grow it organically. 
And that actually ended up being a blessing because it gave me a chance to back off on my expectations, um, get, you know, just get into some markets, build, build uh, relationships with different, uh, you know, my, my vendors and my, my store managers and so forth and, and see how the numbers go. And, you know, I'd adjust, you know, some pricing and things accordingly. And that really, that benefited me because the one thing I didn't really realize is that, and this may seem obvious when I say it out loud, but it takes time. It, it, it took a lot more time than I initially anticipated. So for instance, you know, when you get a new product onto the shelf, uh, you know, somebody has to take that, that leap of faith to try it. Right. And then now they have to try it and like it, but then come back and buy it again. And then you have to build enough repeat customers that come back often enough that they'll actually will turn the product frequently enough to be viable on the shelf. And for me to hang out of the shelf space that the managers give me in the first place. So that takes a year, if not longer. Mm -hmm. So I had to not only develop these new relationships and get the product in there, but I had to let it sort of maturate and, uh, and, and, and let it, and let it kind of, you know, grow organically and become a viable product. So if I had come running out of the gate and, and had my initial expectations, I would have been disappointed. But now that, uh, you know, it's been, I've, I've had it there for a few years now, two or three years. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm starting to see the fruit of that. Let's, I want to talk about the coffee, the process that you went through to, what was the first, what was your first coffee? What was it? Uh, you, have, you currently have four varieties. What was the first one? Well, I knew right away that I wanted to have at least four SKUs. Okay. Um, that seemed to be a manageable amount. It gave me the option to offer four different varieties to kind of cover my basis. Um, I knew that I wanted to have, you know, a fairly narrow interpretation of the Northwest sort of coffee style. You know, I, I knew I wanted to have, you know, a good, strong, aggressive, bittersweet, you know, French roast. And then I, I knew also wanted to have, you know, a, a really nicely balanced medium roast, you know, where it wasn't so bitter. And I wanted to have a few things in between. So once I got my business plan in order and, uh, the one thing that, that I don't do is I am not, I'm not the roaster. I'm not an expert roaster. So the first thing I did was go out and find an expert roaster. And I had relationships in the community and people I could talk to. So, uh, I, I ended up hiring somebody local, uh, to do my roasting and together, you know, based on tapping into their experience, you know, we worked out these four different varieties. You know, I kind of explained to them what I'm looking for. Uh, they had suggestions. I had suggestions, you know, and together we kind of, uh, you know, worked out, you know, these, these four varieties. Does your wife so, drink coffee? Um, oh, yes. Okay. So I want, I want you to go I'm back. I'm a utilitarian coffee drinker. Okay, go mm -hmm. ahead. I want you to go back to when you brought home the first prototype. And you said, here, I want you to try this. So she hasn't, you know, I, I'm imagining this scenario happened. She hadn't tried the prototypes yet, right? You're working through it. You know, you're, you're, you're fine tuning the, 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 the ratio of, you know, things and roast time and all of that. So you finally bring something home and you say, I want you to try this. What'd she say? Oh, uh, she was all in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, she, she knows a good coffee when she drinks it. Okay. And, and this was definitely, this was definitely a good coffee. Okay. So, so you know, we had, we, we did debate a little bit between a couple of different choices and so forth, but, but at the end of the day, uh, that was the easiest part by far. <laughs> okay. How long did the process take for you to, to dial in these, these, um, 
the four four skews? Oh, uh, just a matter of a few months. Okay, so um, I was kind of doing this in tandem while I was, you know, getting my ducks in order as far as like you know banking and uh, building a website and becoming an LLC and and all those right. fun details, all the fun things. I'm going to put you on the spot. You know, I look at, I look at, uh, I kind of, let me use this analogy if I can. You know, when I think of what I was going for is, you know, if you think, if you're a beer drinker, are you? I, I yeah, I mean, not, I'm not an aficionado, but you know, I enjoy beer. So if, if you like a good Northwest IPA, for instance, mm-hmm. you know, to me, that was sort of analogous to what I was going for. Right. Uh, a nice, well-rounded, you know, hoppy, you know, hop, hops and beers, just like the bittersweet characteristics in coffee. It's, mm-hmm. it's required, right? Okay. It's what makes beer and it's what makes coffee, right? Um, but just like an IPA, I wanted a good, well-rounded IPA. I, I didn't necessarily want a, you know, double hopped, cask right. grapefruit infused you know whatever <laughs> ipa right right you know, that's that's fine for some people and that's fine for me sometimes too but sure that's not sort of that baseline of what i'm going for so um yes i have my french which definitely has those more aggressive bittersweet notes to it right yes but as i go down the line of my four varieties you know, I'm, I'm slowly tampering down that bitterness, right. Mm-hmm. To the point where my, my medium roast, which is my fairy line blues, um, what, what it's, it's a blend of central American beans and Indonesian beans. Okay. Now they're both roasted to a Vienna roast, right. Mm-hmm. But when you blend the two together, it just makes it a little more complex and the Indonesian bean is a little more earthy mm-hmm. uh, and doesn't have those, you know, high bittersweet notes like a uh, Central American. So it, it, to me, it creates a really nice, full bodied, flavorful cup of coffee, but almost no bitterness. And then, and then you take my medium dark roast, which is my Salish Orca, uh, you know, here, you know, once again, I'm I'm doing a, a blend, this time the same bean, but one of it, half of it's roasted to a Vienna roast and half of it's roasted to an Italian roast, right? And then blended together. And once again, I think it makes a more complex cup, uh, but it's it takes that, it's not as much of those bittersweet notes, mm-hmm. right? But it still has that, it's, you know, and then we get to my deception dark, which you mentioned early on in this one. And you know what? I got, I, I feel you. I it's probably one of my favorites too, out of the group. Mm-hmm. Just just for my personal taste, because it's it's an Italian roast, but once again I introduce some Indonesian. So I have the Central American roasted Italian, then I have the, the Indonesian roasted Italian. And it's just enough to take off that bittersweet edge, right? But still has that really full body, dark characteristic. So I was going to ask you an impossible question. So I I decided to spare you for that one. So I'm going to ask you a very specific question. Have you been drinking coffee today? Oh, yeah. What's in your cup today? Uh... (laughs) I, I, right now, um, I'm drinking, uh, I'm drinking Fairyland Blues. Okay. I was going to ask you what your favorite was out of all, but that's unfair. So you're drinking Fairyland Blues today. And how do you prepare your yeah. coffee? How is this, how is this cup of coffee prepared? Um, I'm old school. I just like a drip. Yeah, okay. It's something, you know, I can make a nice pot of coffee or two and, and, and drink it throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Um, I do pour over sometimes. And I have a little old fashioned espresso, you know, stovetop espresso machine. <laughs> right. Not machine, but yeah. The old you, Turkish <laughs> things, the mocha pot. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, and I, I, to be honest with you, I only use it when the power goes out. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't have a backup for power. That's a, I have to, okay. All right. That's my takeaway for this episode is I got to make sure I can have coffee when the power's out. All right. Yeah. So you're a, you're a drip coffee guy. Um, I, so literally at the time we started this deception dark from an AeroPress. So I, I make it uh, using my AeroPress maker. So one cup of coffee at a time, kind of a hybrid espresso French press machine, if you will, plunger. If I have the, if I have the grind dialed in, right. The Island sunset and the deception dark are like brilliant through the, the AeroPress, just absolutely brilliant. The Orca and the Fairyland Blues are not quite brilliant. They're like whatever slightly lesser adjective. I do like my coffees darker. So the, the medium roast, but they hold up. That's the thing. They hold up for me. I like a, okay. So you, you lived in West Seattle. Do you remember back in the day, a place called Webster's cafe? I don't. So Webster's cafe had two locations on California. And I remember going in there and I would grab breakfast and they had this thing, you know, Montana potatoes, which were, you know, diced potatoes with egg and sausage and feta cheese and all this stuff. And I would drink coffee and I believe they were serving Seattle's best coffee at that time in the old diner mug thing and all that. And I just, I have this memory buried deep, you know, that that was a delicious cup of coffee. And I think your deception dark is as close to that memory as I'm going to find. It just, it checks some old hidden 35 year old memory. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. I, ironically, the roaster that I work with mm -hmm. has lineage back to Seattle's best coffee. Okay. There we go. So I got to tell you, and you know this. I got to tell you my quick story about you here, about your coffee. My wife got me okay. a gift pack for Christmas a couple years ago. Because she doesn't know what to get me. You know, coffee's like, coffee is like the, that's the, you could get me a, a, well, no, don't get me Folgers, but you could get me coffee and I'm thrilled to have coffee, right? And so I get this pack of your coffee and I'm like, what's this? You know, I've never, I hadn't heard of it. And she goes, Oh, this is, you know, Darlene's husband's coffee. You should check it out. Okay, cool. And I, you know, I don't remember which of the, the three bags I popped open um, first. And I was like, wow, this is really good. She goes, no, you're just saying that. I go, no, I'm really not just saying that. I really like this coffee. And so <laughs> it just was like, you have, and I've told you this off camera. I'm, I'm not saying this to, you know, flatter you. And uh, I genuinely think the coffees that you are presenting uh, to the market are amazing. All of them, all four of them are eminently drinkable coffees. The, the, the Island Sunset if you, and the Deception Dark, if you like darker roasts, are just, they're outstanding. So it took you six months to get the, the, the dialed in. Good, good, good job. I thank you very much. The checks in the mail. I'll be I'll be sending for more coffee soon. Um, you know, so I want to. One of the things you know, you talk about the intersection, you know, of of island life and and brand and coffee. And I think one of the things that I noticed when I opened that that the the gift pack was the presentation of the bag, the 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 label, the artwork. The it doesn't look like you're typical local brand, the typical small local brand. It has, it has a presence to it. And when we talked on the phone before, you know, I told you that, and you had mentioned that, you know, things might be changing. I don't know if I should say that live or not, but anyway, what, when you were designing these labels, can you kind of walk me through the, the design, how you built the brand? from a, a, a design standpoint, what were you thinking? I was thinking touch points to uh, Island Lifestyle. Okay. 
and then trying to attach sort of a, a flavor profile to those touch points. Um, you know, when I think of like Fairyland Blues, for instance, um, of course, you know, I, we could talk all afternoon about the ferry system in Washington State. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, if the ferries is a good thing, it's a bad thing. Uh, it's, 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 it's fun. It's, I enjoy it because whenever I take the boat, uh, you know, there's something about, uh, the, the gentle rockingness and the, and the, the vibration of the engine and so forth. I, I can take the best 20 minute nap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just, it just puts me out. Um, and that's, and that's better than sitting in a ferry. I mean, sorry, sitting in a, uh, in a, in a traffic on the I-5, right? Absolutely. Um, but, but this system is just screwy and it's just got all kinds of problems. And, uh, so there's definitely a lot of, uh, frustration with the ferry system. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, the ferry line blues, uh, and that, and that, so that coffee is, you know, to me, my mellow out coffee, you know, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> um, quick story about the ferry system. Uh, so part of when I was back in the day, when I was in, uh, in Seattle and, and, you know, I was really hip on being in the art scene. And, and, uh, one of the things that I had was an art car back in the day. Actually, I actually had a couple of them. I got one sitting outside of my shop right now. Uh, do you know what an art car is? I'm going to allow you to explain your interpretation of one. I, I, I have seen a couple of pictures of an art car that you, I don't know what, it was a Ford Explorer. So I don't know if you still have the, that or if that was a while ago. And then I have another person that I know has an art car and you're both different. So I'm a, I, I want to hear your explanation and definition of art car. Uh, it's a pretty loosey goosey definition. I think it's anybody that, that uses their vehicle as a canvas. Okay. Whether it be you glue on a whole bunch of toys or you paint it or, you know, do some sort of, you know, I, I think it goes beyond what I would think of a classic car or a classic van dutch von dutch pinstriping or things like that right mm -hmm. um it's more of a individual artistic expression and boy do they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes right and that's what that's the fun of it you take right. you do your car you do it you know how it fits your own sort of artistic aesthetic right and then you i used to go to these art car shows uh and meet up with other art cars and uh, it's a kick. It's a fun. You meet all these individ you know, crazy individuals and so forth. And uh, and the big show of the year would be at the Fremont Fair. They always had this big art car show. And uh, it would attract people from all over the country to come and bring their cars. And it'd oh, be wow. a big, long weekend event. Yeah, it was, it was a hoot. It was a lot of fun. Okay. Um, so my, my particular art car, uh, well, the second one that I did uh, was it is an old Ford Explorer. And I, I painted it from on every surface, and I kind of did this uh, sort of the Day of the Dead theme, um, but I also had sort of an environmental theme attached to it, and sort of celebrating the end of, you know, I mean that car used to be called, you know, the you know gas guzzler SUV back in the day, right? Um, it was sort of vilified, so I was trying to turn that around a little bit, and make this environmental theme, and part of my environmental theme was I had all these, uh, I got all these uh, gas accoutrements you know gas handles and gas cans and things like that and i built the, this collage on top of the on top of the rig and, and part of that collage was i took a whole bunch of old gas cans i found you know old antiques and so forth and and i i knew i had to take the ferry right obviously <laughs> and, and the ferry doesn't allow gas cans on the ferry right so I knew that going into it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to make it painfully obvious. So I literally cut the bottom off of these gas cans, cut the face off of on some of them, drill holes in them, 
and made sort of like this collage of old gas can parts, right? right. And that was really cool, right? And it fit with my, my design and what I was trying to say and so forth. So I start going to these events and I start taking the ferry system and it, it just, just blew their mind. They couldn't get their head around it, right? And every single time I came up to the toll booth and so forth, they looked me over and Sometimes they let me on and sometimes you like, I don't know about this. And then do an inspection and I'd come out and I'd explain what I got on my car and so forth. And, you know, and then they, they would let me on. Um, but it was becoming increasingly more of an issue. I, so on one particular day, I pull up to the ferry. They let me on. And then the captain of the boat comes down and, knocks on my window. I roll down the window and he's looking me up and down and sideways. And he's like, oh, I don't know about this. And so I, I gave him a schmeal. I go, no, man, look, it's obviously these aren't, he goes, you know, I can't allow gas cans on my boat. I go, they're not gas cans. It's artwork. I mean, look at it. They're, they're, there's no way these are functioning gas cans. And the captain turns to me and he goes, well, because these gas cans are cut up, they're no longer Coast Guard approved. And I can't have any un-Coast Guard approved gas cans on my boat. So get off oh, my shit. boat. <laughs> so I had to literally back off, back off the ferry and park in a timeout area. And the ferry left without me. And I'm like complaining to the, the crew. I go, look, I take this ferry all the time. Come on, give me a break. What's going on here? And they said, well... Yeah, we'll just wait and see what the next, because there's two boats that run back and forth on the Clinton uh, Muckleteal run. And so I waited for the second boat to come up and they had already called ahead and basically said, you know, oh, we have this problem, you know, da, da, da. Will you come off the boat and check it out? So the first mate comes off the boat and he comes up to me and immediately he sees me, he just starts laughing. And he goes, oh, it's no big deal. Uh, the captain's a stick in the mud, da, 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 da. So he lets me on the boat. So then, long story short, I, I'm coming back home that very same day and I pull up to the toll booth again to get on the boat to go back home. And the woman at the toll booth looks me over and she goes, oh my God, you, pictures of your car have been in our system all day long. And apparently I was on some sort of uh, ferry boat, do not ride list, you know? <laughs> and so another round of negotiation, I get on the boat. So then I, then I just gave up. I, I redid my collage with some different material. <laughs> Anyways, that's just one of many fairy stories that I could tell. I, yeah. The, yeah. The fairy, the fairy land is... blues. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> What? So my next variety is the Salish Orca blend. Yeah. And just a quick, quick background on that one. Um, you know, I knew right up front as part of my, you know, corporate brand presentation, you know, I wanted to have a little bit of a give, give back to the community. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I had this idea, you know, I wanted to do something with Orca whales. Um, so I reached out to this local organization called Orca Network. And they're a nonprofit uh, here in Freeland. And they do all kinds of things to raise awareness about whales. They have uh, whale watchers and they do whale counts and they do uh, public outreach and education and legislation and so forth for whales and their habitats. And I said, you know, hey, you know, I'd really like to develop a label, you know, where uh, I can give you, you know, a 10% kickback on every bag of coffee that I sell. Um, and they were, they're, they're, they like that idea and so forth. But I wanted it to be, you know, really authentic. So uh, I worked with one of their photographers and uh, we went through different photographs and so forth. And I just, I didn't want to use a stock photo, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I found this one photo that she took. It was actually taken right off Whidbey Island. And it shows these three whales. And there's actually, they each had names and so forth. And there's, that she knew the history of all three whales and all this kind of stuff. I actually have that information on my website. Um, but anyway, so I, I just wanted to use something that was, you know, super authentic, 
you know, worked with the community and then have a community kickback. So that's, that's been a, a popular brand for, for mine as well. So I have to ask you, I'm on the website, I'm looking at the photograph that's zoomed in and you have not that you named the whales, but L88, L117 and L54. From this photograph, how on earth do they, are they able to identify those whales or did they identify them somewhere else? And it went, like well, in this particular shot, I, how, how do you know who's who? <laughs> well, I, you know, all I know is that uh, all, all the whales are carefully and meticulously cataloged. Yes. Um, yes, they are. And they're, and they're all identifiable by their different, uh, different traits that they have on their flukes. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm sorry, on the dorsal fins. Right. Um, every whale's dorsal fin is a little bit different. And those who watch the whales and study them know this. So, yeah. No, and then oh, the, the shot that's the header for the, the Orca uh, network page is that's a cool shot. That's a very cool shot. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I think it's anyway, great. It's, that you're it's important to me to have, a, yeah, a local a local connection like that. And I I really hope that as I grow, I can be you know do a lot more for them and donate a lot more money. Putting you on the spot with a with a question about the future that you're unprepared for, but I'll ask and you can decline. What's your what's what's the likelihood of a decaf? Um, I get this question all the time. <laughs> um, the, it's, I would like to include a decaf and I probably will include a decaf. Um, okay. but I imagine it's a couple of years out. Okay. Um, decaf, I have to be able to move enough of it to keep it fresh. And, mm -hmm. and right now it's, I don't think the fact that it's more expensive is that big of a deal. I can, you know, I, I can make, I can make it a couple bucks more and those who want decaf mm -hmm. want decaf, but I have to be able to move enough of it to keep the product fresh on the shelf. Okay. And that's reasonable. I just don't think I'd be able to move enough of it at this stage. Okay. When, if I get into enough stores and so forth, um, then I'm, I'm going to consider it. Another right. thing I'm another thing I'm playing with is that uh, my daughter and son-in-law live in Kona, mm. so uh, and they've got to, to know a couple growers, coffee growers out in Kona. So my next visit, uh, I'm going to have some conversations with some growers out there, and uh, maybe offer Kona coffee as a, a special one-off every year. And that'd be fun. I'm, I'm giving you a hard time here, but you know, then you can write the, the vacation off as a business expense because you were talking. Oh, talk, yeah. talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, absolutely. So, so you may, so a Kona, uh, a seasonal Kona may be a, something that's in the future. That's kind of cool. I think that, and it ties yeah. into the Island. It ties into Island time. It's a different set of islands, but it ties into Island. The, the whole thing, the thing. Do you have any, do yeah, you have sure. any, do I, they're putting you on the spot, but do you have any plans for a, a, another variety of fifth, a fifth queue? Not, not necessarily a specialty. It's, do you think you're going to add a, another full-time addition? Is that something you've considered or do you, are you really content with the four skews now? So I'm, so yes, I probably will at some point. Um, but right now with the four SKUs, it's, mm -hmm. it's really about, uh, being easy to get on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And with those four, four varieties, it, it's, it gives a nice range, uh, for the customer. Um, but it's also not overwhelming to my shelf presence in, in stores. Um, so I, I don't, I want it to be easy for my, my new clients and my new stores to get into. Um, okay. I think after, after I have more time and more growth, I'll have more sway and say, so I might be able to expand, expand to some degree, but right now I'm, I'm pretty content and just keeping it this way. It keeps it simple, keeps it clean and uh, store managers like it. So, so at this time we're recording this in September of 2024. How many, how many retail locations are you currently, do you have shelf space? 
So this summer, I actually doubled my footprint. Wow. Um, I'm starting, I'm working with a distributor up in Skagit County, and I'm working with another small distributor down in the Seattle area. Okay. Um, they're servicing mostly private stores. It, this isn't really the, the Kroger world or anything like that that I'm into yet. Um, I'm not sure if I want to be. Um, I like being in more smaller, privately owned boutique kind of stores. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm in, I'm in a, I'm in about 40 stores right now. Wow. Um, but like I said earlier in this conversation, it, it does take time. So those, because I just recently kind of doubled my footprint, it's going to take an, an, a year and a half for those, those new stores to really get up and rolling. Um, but I'm hoping by this time next year, um, they will be, I'm not hoping they will be. <laughs> and, uh, and, and my volume will, my volume will, will double. I saw on social media, I, I follow you. I follow the Island time coffee page on Facebook and you did a, a test, a taste test in West Seattle Thriftway. And this is why was this what August, yep. July? It was a little while ago. Yep. Do you mm -hmm. find that when you do a, a store tasting that, um, that sales go up, but they, in, do they in continually stay up from that? I mean, I'm going to guess that you're going to get a bump in, you know, if you're, if you're, taste testing coffee on a Saturday, you're going to sell a few more bags because people go, Oh, this is good. I like this. But do you notice, is this a good way for you to show the public the coffee? Oh, well, absolutely. Um, and yes, you'll get a bump at that particular store and that's cool. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it's more about uh, building brand awareness mm -hmm. and, and getting your brand out there. Um, actually I did two taste testings. I did one in the spring and then one in the summer there. Okay. And it's super interesting. The difference between the first tasting and the second tasting, because the second tasting, I, I was the very first time I had people actually coming up to me and saying, Oh, I know you, or, Oh, I've had your coffee before. Right. Okay. That, that's never happened till just this summer. And I'm like, okay, the, the brand is starting to kind of sink in. I'm kind of, and I'm starting to run into people that, that, that get it and they're right. starting to buy it. So that's, that's the exciting part. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you have anything lined up any more, uh, store tastings for winter time? Do you envision um, doing that? I, I, ha I only have one thing lined up at, the, at this particular moment and that's going to be in November, um, okay. back to West Seattle again. Um, okay. West Seattle is, I think, going to be a, a a good market for me. Um, I think it has the right sort of uh, affluency and, uh, you know, being kind of c close to the islands and so forth. It, it, I think mm -hmm. it just really resonates out there. Um, so that's I'm really keen on building that up. Nice, nice. And I, I I'm just going to applaud you on the the whether you're debating whether. Uh, Nothing against Kroger, but that was the name you threw out there. But Kroger or, you know, Costco or, you know, these big companies can, they can give you a big jolt, if you will, of, but I don't know that it's, if it's a, if it's a, a flash in the pan or a long, long, I think what you're doing is more congruent with a, a small purposeful brand than uh, getting on you know, getting a Kroger buyer to sign off and put you in 65 Fred Meyers and QFCs uh, across the Northwest um, might sound good at first, but then, you know, keeping those, keeping that footage is hard. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think that, uh, I don't think that's congruent with the brand. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the one, sort of ace in the hole that I have with the brand is that, you know, of course I made it, you know, I'm on Woodby Island. Mm -hmm. I made it, you know, Island, uh, lifestyle centric and it works here obviously, but I also think it kind of works anywhere in the greater Seattle basin, the greater North, you know, uh, this side of the state you know, where people do see the islands, they have that connection with the islands, they have that connection with other islands. 
Um, I'm just starting to penetrate um, out into the San Juan Islands, for instance. Okay. And so I think the brand works there just as well as it, do, it does here. Um, so I, I, I agree with you, you know, keeping it to the, you know, the people that are coffee, coffee enthusiasts, mm -hmm. they're going to like it um, for the coffee. Um, and I think they're going to appreciate, you know, sort of like, like I said earlier, that emotional connection with all things island. Yeah, I agree with you. I want to respect your time. So we're going to kind of begin to wrap this one up. So I got some, I got some stock questions I ask everybody. So I'm going to give you the two that I already warned you about. And with you, this is going to be a weird one for the first time. So I'm going to, you know, my, my go-to question is, Hey, I'm getting to Whidbey. Where's a great place to get coffee? So I'm talking to a guy who owns a coffee company on Whidbey Island, but where's, where's a great place to get coffee on Whidbey Island? When you're out and about, oh, wow. where do you go? You... Oh, the timing is just terrible. Uh, a couple of my go-tos have closed. Oh, no. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, always, I always have meetings in coffee shops. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my, my real go-to was uh, um, in, in Langley, um, Useless Bay Coffee, I was blanking. Useless Bay Coffee, uh, great guy, great roaster, mm -hmm. uh, great coffee house. And stuff, but yeah, they didn't make it through the pandemic. Oh, okay. Um, and, and, you know, the cool thing about at least South would be is that we have no chain stores here. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have no Starbucks. We have no McDonald's. We have no Safeway. Mm -hmm. Um uh, and the coffee shops have been kind of coming and going. I okay. I don't have a good. All right, all right. I don't I'll have a good go-to. I'll let you slide. I'll let you slide. <laughs> but the next one I can't let you slide on. So so I'm going to get to the south end of the island. Where's a great place for lunch? Uh, there's some great places uh, in in Langley. Um, Saltwater is a terrific little place. Okay. Um, I like it there a lot. Once again, there's a lot of upheaval during the during the uh, the pandemic. Um, I, I would I would actually point you to one of my all time favorites, and that's actually a little bit of a drive up the island up in Coopville, and it's a little place called Toby's Tavern, and it is it's just one of my absolute go tos. Uh, what you want to do is, is you want to uh, get a pound of mussels, a craft beer, and garlic bread. And you can't go wrong. It uh, sounds awesome, actually. <laughs> that sounds amazing. All right, all right, all right. Because you get you get the fresh fresh mussels right there at Pen Cove, just absolutely delicious. I, I don't know if you're a seafood guy, but I uh, am. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, we, that's we will. You come up. You come up. We'll go to Toby's. How about right. that? All right. So when you're not doing coffee, you're not doing design. I know you're a busy guy, but what do you guys? What do you guys like to do for fun and relaxation? Oh boy. Uh, you know, um, being on the Island, uh, you know, going to the beach, we know a couple of few people that, you know, have beach parties frequently. That's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I actually, you know, there's a bunch of locals that I like to play cards with. That's a lot of fun. Okay. Um, but really it's, it's, it's having kids and, and now grandkids. So that, that, that takes up a lot of our, our time too, takes a lot of time. which is really enjoyable. Variation of my question to you is, is there any good live music places on the Island? Does Whidbey have a good music scene? They do. They have a variety of wineries and, and breweries that have a, a rotating music scene. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a bunch of, of local bands. Um, okay. Yeah, we we go see we go see them fairly often. Okay. Um, that's that's the one thing about I, I kind of miss over here in Wenatchee. It's just we have we have wineries and cideries and that have live music during the summer and outdoors, which is nice until it's 120 degrees outside and then you don't want to be outside. But you know it's it's nice, but it doesn't have. Um, it, it's like okay, so this weekend we're going to go to Conway. 
kind of in your neck of the woods, but on the land, down on the island, and see a friend of ours play at the Conway Muse. So we're going to drive over from Wenatchee, you know, stay overnight. It makes it complicated, you know. It, it makes it complicated. Uh, we we don't have the – I miss that. Uh, let's just say I miss that. So now – as we wrap this up, I got two last questions for you. One of them is my get out of jail free card with regards to you and Island time coffee. What didn't we talk about that we should have? Boy, what didn't we talk about that we should have? Um, I think the one thing that I'd like to interject is just that, uh, you know, as a designer, um, I've worked with a variety of, entrepreneurs and small businesses my entire career and i've always watched people you know take that leap of faith and launch this or do this kind of project or even just a nonprofit or something of that nature and i've always been so impressed with entrepreneurs you know just really interesting great people great projects um and when my time kind of came along where, like I said, I saw a hole in this market, even though it's a super crowded space and hard to break into, I thought, you know what, it's my turn, you know, how about, I want to take a shot at it, you know? And yes, I, I enjoy the coffee. I enjoy the relationships I built. I enjoy, uh, even the manual labor part of, you know, having a coffee company and bagging coffee and doing distribution and all that kind of stuff. Uh, because it's my own business. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, almost regardless of what it is, that's what I'm the most proud of. I, I just, I, I gets me up in the morning. Right. I, I, I like getting up and thinking about what I got to do today and, and the learning curve and, and just, and seeing, you know, incremental success and, and, and then just hearing like you today, you know, the, the flattering words you had to say about the coffee and so forth. Yeah. just like, man, that's, that's the best part. Yeah. I well, just, you have a great product. I mean, you've got great coffee. And, and so it's easy to say it um, when the product is good. So that's the thing. I think that my takeaway from this is what you said about the summer's tasting in the West Seattle Thriftway and people came back and said, I know you and I drink your coffee. That's that had to, if that was me, I'd be grinning from ear to ear. Like I'd be so proud of myself and my product that the consumer who has lots of choices remembers me and it's coming back to me. That's success. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was, that was a great, yeah. that was a great moment in the company. That's yeah, for yeah. sure. All and right. you know, and it, took, it takes two or three years oh, yeah. to get yeah. there. And I didn't know when that was going to happen or when that was going to come, but it's, it's, it's catching on. It's working. Um, Good. you know, ideally if I have a product that sells itself or at least gets you to try it, right. Mm -hmm. Get you intrigued and interested in it. Cause once you try it, I know I got you hooked. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Where can people find out more about Island time coffee? So uh, please visit islandtimecoffeeco.com. Uh, that's my online store. Okay. Um, I'm in most, I'm in almost every store on Woodby Island. I'm on Camino Island at the IGA. Um, I'm in a variety of stores in the San Juans. And um, I'm in a variety of thriftways down through um, King County. So um, I'm at the Ballinger Thriftway. I'm at the West Seattle Thriftway. Um, I'm down in Olympia. At, there's two Thriftways down there. Oh, you're um, in Stadium you're in, Thriftway. You're in Bayview, in Olympia. Yeah. 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 Okay. And you're in Stadium Thriftway. Yeah. Good. Just, yeah. 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 Just got in there. Nice. Um, so yeah, uh, please uh, go buy a bag of coffee. <laughs> Try it out. Go. All right. All right, so here's that question I warned you about. You ready? You have to answer this question, setting the, right. setting the table. You have to answer it, and you have to give me your reason why. There's no excuse here. You can't back out. All right. Cake or pie, and why? Uh, pie all day. Okay. Uh, why? I, I like fruit pies. I like cherry pie. Okay. All right. That's fine. <laughs> 
There's no wrong answer here. There's just some, pe- some people are like, I can't decide. And other people are like, it must be cake. Pie is wrong. And, you know, it's just kind of funny to listen to people's, um, people's opinions. So why? Well, so you I, like- I got one even better. I have a nice piece of pie with some uh, Deception Dark or, uh, or, or French Rust. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very solid, uh, solid combo, isn't it? So, um, well, Chris, I appreciate you sitting down with me today. I genuinely am grateful that my wife got me your coffee for Christmas to, to start this, this coffee journey for me. I drink a lot of coffee. I try to drink coffees that are roasted in this, in Washington state as much as I can. And yours is inspired me to, to try something with explore Washington state, which I can't really I can't reveal for this episode. So people have to tune in later. Uh, but it's, I genuinely think you are, I don't want to say the best coffee that seems, you know, I, you are, but you are you, Island time coffee and I'm going to go with the French, the, the French rust. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to plant my flag and I'm going to say that the Island Sunset is mine. Go to coffee. So thank you. Right for the on. Coffee. I, I super appreciate your time and I super appreciate your kind words. All right. And your support. There we go. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the show. You can reach me on Twitter at Explore Wa State. I'd love to hear your comments. You can also visit our website at explorewashingtonstate.com. If you know anyone who would like the show, it'd be amazing if you'd share the show with them. This is the biggest way that we grow this show. Good old word of mouth. Glad you were here with me today, and I hope to have you listening to the next episode. See you then.